they're linked in sensibility, but they're physically one is set off the other. Mm -hmm. And what I love is, I mean, all of that is rooted in a purpose as well. You know, simple fact that wood wants to stay dry. Right. You know, so you, you, you hold it off the ground, you know, but in doing so, now you have an attitude about the site. Successful projects have a kind of marrying of these different aspects that we're talking about. It serves a functional purpose and expresses a, a kind of poetic attitude about respecting the site, the nature, letting the nature flow right under the building. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we have Tom Lane, an architect at Witten Architecture based in Portland, Maine. Tom received a Bachelor of Fine Art from University of Massachusetts Amherst and a Master of Architecture from the University of Utah, where he was awarded the school's highest design honor. Mm. As an author and illustrator, Tom's work is published in the Architect's Guidebook to, to Structures textbook. That's pretty cool. Uh, he has been a design critic at the University of Utah and the University of Maine at Augusta. That would be pretty fun, design critic. I've I've often kind of thought I'd like to do that. But I think you really should. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, our interview today is sponsored by Maine Home Design. Don't miss AIA Design Theory in the upcoming August issue. Tom's AIA Design Theory in the upcoming August issue of Maine Home Design. Thank you again for coming into the studio today, Tom Lane. Thank you for having me, Trent. Absolutely. We we got talking a while back on, uh, let's see, we were, we were out in the Roke Bluffs area. That's right. And I remember we got kind of into it and I was like, oh, we got to save these kind of conversations and get them on camera sometime. That'd be great. That's right. I can't believe how, how long ago that was now, but it was two years ago this summer, I think. Was it? Yeah. We were, we were um, shooting a, a project and... We took a break for lunch, I think, and started talking about, I don't know. Design theory and yeah. belief and, and as it all relates and everything else. And mm. to me, it's all interesting because uh, there's, that for one, there's a large degree of um, need for uh, creativity and imagination when you're envisioning what lies out potentially outside of this world or not. And when you're designing something, you're also creating and using that to inform what actually happens. And so that's always been a very interesting how those things cross pollinate for me. Mm -hmm. And both you and I come from uh, backgrounds or belief systems that are essentially Christianity with added sprinkles. Um, but uh, how do you feel that believing uh, in an outside higher power consciousness, if you will, uh, actually does translate into uh, what you design, how you design, and how you approach design. I think it's a it's an interesting question, and it it it, um, it relative to um, trying to let the architecture be derivative of a particular place. Um, you know. There's there's sort of two things that we're talking about. We're talking about kind of um, universal things, and we're talking about specific things. Right, you know? kind of your belief of the universal right. and how it comes into the specific, and how it relates, how it manifests in, in into a specific work in a specific place. Right, and to me, I I find interest in does it actually affect that, and could you see a difference somehow mm -hmm. between someone who held belief of an outside consciousness compared to someone who did not believe of an outside consciousness, but maybe approached the same problem, yep. but did it differently. I think it has a little bit to do with just being open, mm -hmm. uh, approaching a, a problem from a, uh, an open standpoint or even a, a humble standpoint okay. uh, that I'm not bringing all the answers to this. Mm -hmm. I'm coming with a question, right? I'm, I'm approaching a, uh, a place or a site or a architectural design problem with with questions, not answers. Hmm. Hmm. So it's okay. it's a little bit more of a you know, it's a it's a it's an approach that um, says that I don't have all the answers. I'm a I'm someone who's seeking, mm -hmm. and I want to find out what this place uh, has to tell me. Right. That's interesting because the uh, I would I would imagine in my both um, 
in in my both atheist mind and believer mind that that now are much more active in in my head mm -hmm. they they are both uh equally humbled in mm -hmm. that and both um kind of have that same approach that going into any situation i have to pull from my experiences and how they overlay on what i believe mm -hmm. and there's a um a quality to my judgment that comes from hashing out belief and um experience that you know produces cognitive dissonance at points and you work those out right and then you come to a new uh situation a new problem that mm -hmm. maybe a design it's a design problem and you approach it with humbleness in that there there's in my opinion no way of of um encapsulating an idea of something beyond that would give you uh absolute answers that you could then solve problems with to that degree of specificness right and then uh, the atheist mind to me as well would come to that in the same way of saying this is a vast mystery that still requires so many questions right and i was just speaking with someone the other day who um you know, it, was, it felt like no, no matter the, there, there'd be outliers like extreme fundamentalists on, on either side of, of a belief spectrum that mm -hmm. would maybe bring that personality to a problem that they're approaching. But I felt like the, the same, the same, the intentionality mm -hmm. of someone who's saying I'm considering the beyond and how that influences my day-to-day -day actions on either side, no matter atheist or whatever, um, the intentionality being there creates a person that's more actively processing and intentional about what they're doing. And to me, it seems like they produce the same end results. And I'd have a difficult time saying uh, this person uh, with the solution came from a belief process that informed that compared to a non-belief process. Uh, and I'm, I'm already losing and confusing myself in that, but <laughs> <laughs> I think to, to kind of engage with that, with, with, with your line of, of thinking there, um, you know, I, I think you, you mentioned sort of fundamentalism and th there's an aspect of, of that, which kind of feels like it knows the answer, you know? Yeah. So, so, and which is kind of a closed position, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so relative to approaching a design solution um uh i like to think that it's a more interesting open process um to to approach it rather than saying i know the answer before we before we get there before we start the the, the design problem because i adhere to these principles mm. uh i'd rather say that you know i well fundamentalist i'd say yeah. they almost they almost bring laws mm -hmm. rather than principles. I, I I think that's true. I think so. So that's sort of that's that's an that's an approach to life, probably. I mean, that's right. you know that that can apply to your um, kind of uh, spiritual side or not. Right. But I think a kind of mature approach to uh, belief in your place in the kind of universe, because you know that's. What we're talking about a little bit um a mature approach to that uh leads to humility because you 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 uh uh you realize that there's only a few things that you're certain of you know mm. and um this kind of universal aspect that we're talking about i find is 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 interesting but I'm more interested in the specific um, and in the um, particular uh, and in grounding that that whole conversation into something that is physical and in front of us that we mm -hmm. can touch. You know, a a uh, a you know some moss on a stone on a on a site that you mm -hmm. that when you arrive there, there's something about that specific experience that 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 um, that brings out the kind of spirit of a place, right? That, that there's a, there's a, um, you know, being open to what that specific experience tells you, uh, spiritually is 
is interesting yeah. uh, to me from, from a design as now, a designer. When you approach, and, and this is this is a great segue into actually what you're writing on in your design theory mm -hmm. um, article, and, and it's very interesting. Now, do you when you approach a site, do you feel that there is truly something other than simply matter with uh, quantum and electrical connections that we observe? Do you feel that there's actually more there that communicates like a spirit of place to you to some degree? You know, I think that, um, I think we as human beings, you know, have uh, feelings, emotions, imagination that overlays our direct experience of floors, walls, ceiling, light. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, you know, that's sort of what poetry is about. That's what art is about, mm. uh, is about uh, bringing out that sort of, um, that sort of aspect of, of the physical world. Right. What, like you said, sort of atoms, kind of an electrons. X factor that you absorb yeah. from experience right. in, a, in any place, any person, right. any place, any situation, there's, there's something, there's an impression that you're left with that later you may have another experience and there might be a flavor of that in that. And it's a, a reminder of it or, yeah. Right. So music, you know, is notes and, uh, and chords, but it's, it's, a you know, we hear a song and that, that, that's something different to us as human beings. Mm. Right. So a, a, a place is like, you know, uh, atoms, small things that we can measure but there's an aspect that we can't measure, and that's the poetic aspect that um, is 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 kind of a rich source to draw on. It requires a little bit of a different it's lens. Inspiration and yeah, yeah. There there has to be a a sensitivity and an openness to perception of that experience. That as a good artist, architect, and so on. You're able to pull that in. Well, especially as an architect, because you're not simply communicating your voice into art. You're taking a place and you're taking a client's programmatic mm -hmm. uh, issues that they need solved and their uh, their experience of that place and everything else and their desires. And you're translating and you're connecting. You're like a technician and an artist and a communicator and a, you know psychologist all at once kind of yeah it's different hats or different lenses or you know th there's different ways um to solve the to solve a kind of problem holistically mm -hmm. and and so as an architect you, especially designing someone's home you're you're asked to kind of bring your whole person your whole experience to that design problem mm -hmm. so you're not designing uh you're not solving the problem from a function standpoint or a uh, you know thermal envelope standpoint um, on its own. Right. You're also right. creating an experience that someone's going to live there and create memories there, and their children will be there, right. and um, they'll be there in summer, they'll be there in winter, and and there's an aspect of that that um, that makes it richer and makes it kind of poetic. So you 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 it's. You have to um, you have to be open to that. Mm. Yeah, that that uh, that kind of that kind of gives me goosebumps to 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 put all that together and to to hear it in that manner. And it's it's uh, it's interesting to um, to see the the very uh, intentionally and knowingly humble approach to that while um, while practicing a, a religious belief practice and that sounds mm -hmm. kind of like an insult like i'm expecting you to be closed-minded because you <laughs> practice religion and that comes from my own baggage of <laughs> that i'm working through so don't sure. take that personally sure. but no. yeah that's that's um encouraging and inspirational to me to to interact with someone who is uh humble and open and uh and working create creatively and producing something of value and being open to that. And that's, 
Yeah, we're just working through my issues here, so let's get back. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, you have this platform for that purpose. So. Yeah, maybe maybe <laughs> a lot of other people have similar issues as, as me in some way, I don't know, but uh, you've thought about it, and it, it's interesting. Uh, I don't, it's hard for me to find someone who's um, thought as much about what they believe and how it connects to what they do and how they serve others in in a in a design format like that, and, right. and is able to verbalize it. Yeah. It's it's not people do it really well, yeah. but they might not be able to articulate it to the right. level and the depth that, that right. you are. I I I consider it something like you know uh, I don't personally have all the answers. I'm a, uh, a participant. I'm a uh, uh, you know I'm a questioner, and I'm and I'm on. A journey that we're all on, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in this experience, right? And um, I think it's interesting that in our our work, you know, together with my my colleagues at at Witten Architects, we get to tap into these kind of uh, poetic moments and draw them out because, you know, this kind of our our experience in the universe is a little bit too broad. But our, our experience in this room with these objects, with these other people, is specific and, and can be very meaningful mm. and can, I think, uh, open open our eyes to what those other broader things mm. might be. How much time do you spend um, considering, on a daily basis, how much time mm. do you spend considering your meaning and place in the universe and how much do you think that directly influences your effectiveness as a designer? You know, I, I I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, it's a bit of a hard question. I think these things in our experience as human beings are not, uh, are not sort of, uh, separate, you mm -hmm. know, right. These things are overlaid, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, especially working from home. Right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because you know your honey. Can you reach us at the top cabinet? Yeah, and it's yeah. and it's you know your your. In my case, I have two daughters. You know what I mean? And yeah. they're you know they're they're. Uh, I interact with them much more on a daily basis now. And for me, they're my door to um, a, a broader universe. You mm. know, um, and a, and a and a deeper meaning to all of the things yeah. that we do yeah. on a daily basis. So, you know, it's it's. Um, I don't know that I'm conscious of of that effect. That might be for someone mm -hmm. else to say, yeah. um, looking at the way I work. But hmm. it, sp speaking of the um, influence that we have on others through the interesting thing, kind of a side note, um, the the influence that we have on others in in a way of comparing them as far as how you relate to people compared to how what you uh what you maybe like when i when i look at my kids it's very interesting to me that at the end of the day if i'm only telling them what to do or not do mm -hmm. they'll they'll be bucking against that by the end of the day mm -hmm. but if i model it and i'm present with them all day at the end of the day there's just hugs, good feelings, and well-behaved children who've caught, you know, who they need to be from right. me rather than being told. Right. And that that ability to to know that and to use it to make yourself be present and be able to hear people, to be able to hear clients mm -hmm. and uh, work with them effectively, I think, if, if a person has that mindset of, relationship is so key here rather than a list of do's and don'ts or, right. or whatever. So you, you're talking again about, you know, principles versus experience, you know, yeah. sort of in, in there's, there's principle in instruction that can happen. Mm -hmm. But if that, if that's not presented, I'd in, say with, law instruction. Uh, okay. To me, principles are, are, are more, um, not ambiguous, but mm -hmm. they're more, they're 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 not delineated lines as much as guiding principles sure. if but like what you're saying to me right now i i view as like uh laws okay like do's and don'ts yep right so there's a there's a presentation of law 
in a certain way. And there's a presentation of it with basically love, which right. uh, is, is different. And so this kind of, you know, uh, open approach to experience, I think just makes life a little, a little more uh, interesting, artistic, poetic. You know, mm. we, we have an opportunity to, to stop and appreciate the things that are around us rather than kind of be in conflict Mm -hmm. with them um and that's that's part of the theory that you know i'm putting forward which isn't my personal theory i mean this is a theory that i read about as a student um christian norberg schultz is a norwegian uh architect uh author theorist mm -hmm. who, who puts forth who puts forward this idea of um the spirit of a place, mm -hmm. you know, uh, genius loci is what, yep. is what he calls it. And, um, and that kind of concept, you know, sounded kind of, uh, exotic and mysterious to me, you know, as a student and still does. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe why I like it. I like, I like revisiting it because it, it has a kind of richness, um, and it, it, it opens up your thinking after you've, tried to solve a problem in a very pr pragmatic way. Right. So I, I see that as um, that ability to, to maintain openness in your approach to solving design problems mm -hmm. would be like having a tractor that you're using that, that breaks down, you fix it, it gets scratched, you use it, it breaks, you're fixing it. And, you know, over time that tractor does so much and it and looks like it's done so much and it has been useful compared to uh, a tractor that you get you keep in the garage and it's perfect mm -hmm. and you only use it to do very exact occasional things like if you mm -hmm. had instead of uh it, was it loki the name yeah the uh, term genius loki genius loki instead of an approach like that if you had more of a say rigid all right it's classical architecture for me mm -hmm. and we use the golden ratio and that's it mm -hmm. you know that is an approach and it has been proven to produce buildings that are kept around right but it it doesn't leave an openness to to everything that you might find a an, an upgrade to certain things or right. an improvement upon certain things i think even with that approach in in great you know works of architecture regardless of their kind of style um if they if they express that kind of if that spirit of that place is kind of manifest through them, you know, I'm thinking mm -hmm. great works, you know, uh, the Pantheon or something, mm. you know. Um, Have you been to the Panth Pantheon? You know, I, I haven't. This is on my list of, oh, of of places to go. It's so amazing. It uh, it just says something about it when you walk in. You're at yeah. that base of the full circle contained in there, you know, and it's just odd. So there's there, there's a spiritual aspect to that place is kind mm. of where I'm headed that it's it's uh, and it's rooted it couldn't be anywhere else but where it is the material um, the the quality of light yeah these are these are poetic aspects of a building that is built with you know rigorous rules at the same time so mm. it, it's it's like anything of value it's a combination. Yeah. It's a, it's a, um, it's an overlay. Right. Right. Yeah. It's one of the things that was so amazing to me about the Pantheon as well is that the streets have just through accumulation grown up around it by mm. like 15 or 20 feet. Mm. You, you see time translated into just yeah. mass coming up around something. It's amazing. Right. Layers. So layers, layers and layers. Happening. Um, yeah. So that kind of ties into the, 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 thing that you mentioned in what I read around theory and practice mm. that, that you can get into practice, but you also intentionally uh, practice theory to mm. a large degree, mm. that, that you take time to actually look into theory and not get too caught up in simply practice. You know, when you're, when you're practicing, you know, there are serious practical matters to con to concern yourself with, yeah, uh, architecture, um, and any 
any good design is solving many things at once, um, but it's solving all those things for human beings, right? So it's for your use, uh, for, for the use of uh, the people who will be in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, it's, it's a, um, this kind of idea is one voice in my head um, that uh, kind of tests a design problem that's in the works, you know? Um, okay, it's, this is working, the, the, the program is laying out in a way on, that makes sense on the site. Uh, we have, you know, the sun coming in uh, to the kitchen in the morning. The kitchen has purview over the, you know, driveway. Kind of objective data points yes. to a degree that you're working with right. there. Uh, we've we've looked at the the topography. You know, we, we've had a site survey done. We've marched around on site with flags and uh, you know tape measures, and we, we kind of we have an understanding of the. We've interpreted that that data in a certain way. But uh, now, you know, what about the aspect that's going to elevate this to right to a different. What's going to give it this X factor mm -hmm. that you can, that you invest in time and experience on that site as a designer and you try and translate your, right. your felt subjective experience into that built environment along with uh, translating what your clients are communicating to you as well. And so we, we look to those things, um, we look to that kind of line of thinking to answer questions for us. Like now that we have something solved to a point, what is, what is this surface? How should it read? What's the texture? What's the color? Um, what's the, you know, what's the light going to be like at this time of day when it hits this wall, what should that wall feel like? Mm -hmm. Um, and and it begins to inform those you know because there's endless possibilities so yep. how do you answer those questions mm -hmm. and we look to the site to tell us right tell us the answers to those questions now they're fairly well known a uh, differing philosophical approaches to um creating something that looks like it should be there as opposed to something that looks like yeah, I put this here and I did exactly what I wanted. Do, do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like there's this island in Casco Bay where someone just disregarded all, mm -hmm. everything, <laughs> regulations and mm -hmm. everything else. And there's all these massive red barns and huge like Greek columns. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. been by that island I, or not. I, I don't know it, but I, I hear what you're saying. You know, the two approaches. One is it something kind of looks like it grew right out of the site. And another mm -hmm. one is a kind of counterpoint to the site just imposed on it. Right. Yeah. Right. And that, that can be done in such a way that it enhances what's on the site. Kind of a complimentary contrast or right. something. Right. I, I think of kind of the, uh, the, uh, Villa Savoie, you know, Le Corbusier's white house on mm. Piloti that sits in a green landscape and it's, it's a deliberate. Right. Right. Separation from, you know, it's 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 a it's deliberately saying this is man made, this is nature, and they they mm. one sits on yeah. the other delicately, uh, and then one's white and the other is green. Right. You know. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a loud uh, accident. You know. Right. Where it can be if not done uh, thoughtfully, but right. like in that instance, it's a it's a beautiful contrast. Right. So mm. it it doesn't have to, you know. This this kind of site responsive design work, trying to find the spirit of the of the of the place, um, doesn't mean that it's going to be you know woodsy and brown and dark. You know, mm -hmm. it, it if you're on a wooded site, um, it might mean that you enhance that. Maybe you, you know, I'm thinking of the of, of a project that um, you you photographed, um, and uh, you know the the site was kind of mossy and, and, and a little bit dark. And, um, we decided to engage with that 
we decided to kind of root into that with board form concrete in one aspect, build right from the exposed ledge and lay these layers of board form concrete that kind of felt like it was growing right out of the ledge, mm. you know, um, on one aspect of the house. And the other aspect is galvanized steel columns that, uh, you know, are very deliberately pinned to that ledge and are a counterpoint to it. Mm. So then the house sits on on these these columns and, and kind of floats above the site uh, right. in addition to engaging with it. Right. Yeah, I uh, we were just taking a walk in the woods yesterday uh, with my kids and uh, we found a well, we found this apple tree that was like this big around and it had been burnt out in the middle. It looked like mm. the thing looked like it should be 200 years old. But there's a lot of just rolling ledge very similar to that site that you're speaking of. And to me, it's always been nice in those situations to think about somehow just anchoring to those and spanning and letting the landscape just be very natural, but have kind of that pulled up and just floating above. Maybe it was your guys' project that shooting that, you know, really mm -hmm. got me thinking more and more about that to somehow span those distances, but just kind of be in it, but just a little above it and supported by it. Yeah, there's sort of a, um, you know, different historic precedent, different cultures have done this in different ways. You know, this, what we're talking about, has a little bit of a... a an Asian sort of or Japanese kind of garden feel where, mm -hmm. you know, there's, um, there's columns that sit on site. There's a, there's a long porch. Um, and the relationship between site and building is, is a little bit separated, but they're, 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 they're linked in sensibility, but they're physically one is set off the other. Mm -hmm. And what I love is, I mean, all of that is rooted in, in a, a purpose as well, you know, simple fact that wood wants to stay dry. Right. You know, so you, you, you hold it off the ground, you know, but in doing so now you have an attitude about the site. Right. You know, and, right. and on the, on the project we were talking about earlier, the concrete doesn't care if it gets wet. Mm -hmm. So you can bring that right on top of the stone. And so there's a, um, you know, I think successful projects have a kind of marrying of, of, these different aspects that we're talking about where there's a, um, it serves a functional purpose doing what we're doing, um, and expresses a, a kind of, um, poetic attitude about respecting the site, the nature, letting the nature flow right under the building, for mm -hmm. example. Now, uh, I had read that you have been involved in some, um, museums and such. I have worked in museum projects, yeah. Talk to me about working on uh, projects of that scale compared to working as a residential architect. Hmm. Yeah, I, I had the opportunity to, um, been working out west, I worked in Salt Lake City for a while. Uh, Beautiful city, by the way, we went through there a few years ago. It, it is, and it's it's a uh, um, great city for, you know, being, having a real urban place really close to uh, the Wasatch Front, the Rocky Mountains are right there. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the university is, too. Um, and we worked on um, the, uh, the Utah Museum of Fine Art. Um, oh, wow. Which is a, uh, a project that was completed by uh, or designed by Machado and Silvetti. They're out of Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I worked for the firm that was the, the, the local architect, and we had, we were, commissioned to come back and do some uh, addition, remodel mm -hmm. kind of work there. Um, but I, you know, for me, I love, I love museums. I, since I was, you know, uh, a kid, I, I love that it's a different, uh, it's a different world. It's, it's, it's not the street or a house, you know. I mean, I would go on field trips. I grew up in Massachusetts. I would go on field trips to the Museum of Fine Art uh, in Boston mm -hmm. or the Isabella Stewart Gardner. And, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of a temple for art. There's a, there's an, a, a quietness. Uh, there is a, uh, sense of respect, but it's a public place. Reflective space as well. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're there specifically seeking a certain kind of experience, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I love the Portland Museum of Art. 
uh, here in, uh, in Maine as well. And, you know, so scale, scale matters, you know, on, on that kind of thing. But even in a large scale building, you're still looking for the human experience. You're still looking for the handrail on the, on the grand stair that takes you to the second level. You're still wanting to engage somebody um, on a kind of tactile, personal level mm -hmm. and take them through a space which might be uh, you know, grand and inspiring, but you're still right. looking for those opportunities. Yeah, you're, you're communicating a different how to be while you're in this space between a residence and a museum. Right. I mean, a, a public building, too, is about seeing other people and being seen there mm -hmm. as a kind of citizen of this public space. You know, you're kind of, you, you might behave differently, you know, because you're on display and other people are on display. Right. So there's, there, there's that aspect in a big public building, like a, um, a museum or a library. But, um, you know, a home serves different functions because there's sometimes when it's just you and, and your family there, or just you there. Right. And then there's, there's the guest mode, too. Right. And how does that work? And how, um, how is that... How does that change the atmosphere of a home when it's in that mode? Um, uh, you know, how does it change the atmosphere of a home when everybody's at home? And when you're, you know, when your kids are home from school right. and you and your wife are working from home, you Ooh. know, so that that yeah. sort of tests, yeah, that kind of tests the house out in a different in a different mode. Um, are you guys all still working from home right now? Uh, we are. Yeah. Uh, and it's been a good, you know, I, I, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, this, you know, working from home experience is not equal for everybody. Um, in, our, in my, you know, personal case, it's been a, it's been a time to, you know, be with my family more often than I have ever. So it's, yeah. it's, it has a positive aspect. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've works obviously been a lot slower for me since March mm -hmm. and, it's been it's been really nice to have just more flexible time to just you know go on walks in the woods with right. my kids and now that things are starting to you know ramp back up there, there's definitely a little bit of a pit in my stomach like like ah man I'm gonna it's gonna get busy and I'm not gonna you know be able to spend as much time and you know and so the you know the stress starts to come back in of like all right you got to start being productive and yeah, right. Busy. Yeah, it does, it does it asks the question, you know, is there a way to kind of design your, is there a different approach to designing our lives now, now that we've seen this, mm. this one way of living that it will inform things? Yep. I don't know. So going back to museums and art, uh, kind of an off, not off topic question, but um, how do you experience and take in art? Uh, when you go to a museum compared to um, seeing and experiencing art like in a residential setting or something else? Because I found that with my unique brain, me, not that I'm unique, but my, my experience, it's very difficult for me to absorb art and, and vision and meaning and everything of a piece of art unless I'm stuck in a place with nothing else to do other than to look at that so in a museum i can kind of control my pace and i just go through and i don't right. and but what i have found is like in going like to marriage counseling and stuff if they have a uh piece of art there i just i start to see and experience because i'm 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 digging deep and being reflective mm -hmm. in the conversation in that setting and then there's this piece of art that visually i start to interact with and see meaning from myself in it and stuff and it's interesting um it it, it is and that's an aspect of museum design where you know it, it can be kind of overload mm -hmm. if you're going to a place that has and you you intend to see a whole museum in in an afternoon you know you're, you're kind of talking about pace you know you kind right. of um you know sitting with you know they have benches you know sometimes but sometimes it's crowded and you move on you know, sitting and kind of dwelling with a with a particular piece of art, 
um, can be really rewarding. Yeah. You know, and then what I find too, um, I had this opportunity in, in October. Um, we, uh, we went to Spain as a, as a, a family for a family trip. Um, and with my daughters, we went to, uh, the Picasso museum, um, and, um, you know, various, uh, Picasso works around, but it was, you know, sitting with them, asking them to sit there. We, we got there early in the morning. There wasn't, it really wasn't very crowded. Um, and, um, asking them to sit there and, you know, I'm, I'm the dad asking them, okay, can, now, can, can you guys sit here and maybe sit with this? Draw, you know this painting for a little while yep. and then it gave them some paper and asked them to, to draw what they were looking at oh cool you know so they're they're kind of drawing away i've saved these drawings for how us. long did they actually stay there they, do that? they stayed there for a surprising amount of time i think it was early you know we had just had some like nice like uh i don't know baked goods on the way over or something but we caught them at the right moment anyway it's a it's a memory that'll stick with me and it caused me to see something different because they were there mm. and because we were you know I, they were concentrating. I was concentrating, seeing this particular work. So it, you have to give it time, I guess. For you, what does answer. what does great art do for you? You know, as a as an architect and as a you know someone who who draws and kind of engages with it, you, you end up you see something that's um, done in a particular way and first is just sort of admiration or appreciation for you know what somebody's been able and skilled enough to create mm -hmm. you know um and that's sort of like the maybe kind of phase one but you know the kind of the the deeper you go into it whether it's kind of a um i don't think i'll pick sort of andrew wyeth or some you know uh uh, good um, artists with a local connection, you know, they're they're painting a whole world. You know, they're looking out a window into a whole uh, world, um, and and it's a it's a moment in time. I mean, it, it can be a powerful experience if you kind of spend uh, spend time with it, um, and it's a it's a it's a chance to kind of get out of your own uh, way of seeing things. Hmm. Yeah, the 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 truly great and long lasting art seems to connect across the board mm -hmm. as it is something that someone has to a degree looked into the void and seen something in addition and has mm -hmm. brought it back <laughs> and has said, here it is. What do you guys think? And mm -hmm. it's kind of like everyone's like, yep, we see it too. You know, yeah. there's there's that experience of the creative g possessing openness as a personality trait, venturing into experience in the unknown, the chaos, if you will. Right. And bringing something back in the form of art and articulating that in art and then handing it to the general population. And they right. say, wow, we, we see more now. Right. They're, they're, they're going into the mind for us. Right. Yeah. They're kind of going and finding this something, bringing it out, putting it in front of us, mm. uh, a Rothko painting, something that's kind of abstract where you're kind of, um, you're, you're, you're just there in observation, but mm -hmm. you, you see something of what the artist saw. Right. And, and that's about, again, not, not thinking as as yourself you're opening your um perception to their perception mm. which is you know usually highly sensitive and highly specific yeah it, it's it's really interesting to me i keep i gotta get away from that word because i i just lead out with that every time it's really interesting <laughs> to me but anyways i find it fascinating um the the peering into the chaos and, and, and the artistic personality is generally more sensitive, more volatile. Uh, and, but there's an ability through that to perceive more and to then return with something. And there's also a personality trait of openness that 
allows them to venture into the unknown and experience and bring that back. Um, and there's, there's a typically liberal personality type, and I'm not talking politically or anything else. They have, it branches out that way and will generally end up there. But as a personality type of someone who's more conservative or mm -hmm. personality type is more liberal, um, a, cons a conservative will be more organized uh, yeah. and will be more consistent and more reliable. And a liberal personality type will be uh, more sensitive, more open to new experiences, um, and will find comfort and meaning from change and exploring chaos, where a conservative personality type will more so want to exist within the realm of the, the known and organize and manage that a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you had endless liberal personality types, nothing would get done. <laughs> and we'd all be running into walls and around. And if we had all conservative, yeah. we'd never discover anything new potentially, right? Yeah. And so they're an extremely complementary um, marriage. Uh, yeah. it's, it's as much as male and female. Yeah. Uh, a distribution of the personality types across the world is pretty much 50-50. And you see it actually when it translates into voting, um, you'll have just a very conservative base, a very liberal base, and there's very few that are in between who actually kind of make the decision the, right. the independence, right? And, and I, I love the I love the the counter examples to that, mm -hmm. to that division, you know. Uh, and this is you know part of what being an architect is for me is 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 reconciling that, you know. Well, I'm, it's I'm, demanded of an architect. Yeah, you have yeah. to bring that organizational and that experiential in, and that's right. I think why they call architecture one of the greatest art forms. I, I forget who that quote is and what exactly the quote. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, that it's demanded. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of um, uh, Anthony Gaudí. Mm -hmm. Okay, who you know again we, because we were in Barcelona this this last uh, October. Um, you know, here's a a very devout uh, soul, mm -hmm. uh, Gaudí, um, expressing himself in these um, fascinating, fantastic rich forms inventive architecturally mm -hmm. um and it's it's a it's a it's a coming together of you know his mind is a kind of coming together of those two sensibilities mm -hmm. you know and he's and his expressing it in a certain way um in in religious art you know in sagrada familia the the big the big cathedral you know that's still under construction still right? under construction a couple hundred years going <laughs> Um, and it's, it's yeah, beautiful it's and awesome. amazing that there's no other place like it. I mean, we, um, uh, were able to, to, to visit it. I was able to be there again with my daughter. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is a, this is a kind of a place that represents to me that kind of marriage mm -hmm. of, um, being a seeker mm -hmm. and, and asking questions. Mm-hmm. All right, you said seekers, so I'll, I'll throw this one at you. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, the uh, there's a saying I forget who who came up with it first, but um, join those who are seeking the truth, flee from those who believe they found it. Ah, yeah. what do you think of that? I, I guess um, you know, as an individual person, um, you know. You're, you're, if you're a curious person, then you'll find different sources of truth on your particular search. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I wouldn't flee from someone who's trying to answer my question, mm -hmm. but their answer might not be a complete answer. And right. that's up to me right. to decide. Yeah. I, to me, I take my takeaway from that quote is that, you know, beware of the extremes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, the and we see that in today that, you know, the uh, a very extreme left viewpoint of nothing is true. Mm -hmm. You know, you just make your own meaning. You make your own everything. It's nothing. There is no truth, which in itself is a contradiction. Um, and then, you know, the, the other direction you can go with that. So. Yeah, it's it's uh, 
Interesting. But as I was saying earlier, the, um, where the artist goes out and brings something back Mm -hmm. and then there's kind of the caretakers of our civilization are the more conservative minded types. They guard what is known, Mm -hmm. you know, and they manage it and they organize it. And if that were not there, we would be in a huge amount of hurt. Conservative personality types play an immense role and they, they, they protect and curate and maintain what is articulated knowledge, what is known. And it's as it should be that it is extremely difficult to find further truth that is accepted into the established articulated set of knowledge that we as a society maintain. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that for a long time because I'm, I'm neither a leader nor a follower. I have a weird thing going on Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it seems like I'd perceive things and I'd try and run it against people that I know that are conservative, not against, but I'd run it past them and they yeah. just constantly block. And and, right. and I realized at one point that's how it should be, that mm. were you to just throw whatever you wanted into the articulated knowledge that we have as a society, that it would be absolute chaos everywhere. But there's that, um, there's a proximal zone of development where you can place yourself comfortably in the chaos and the unknown Mm -hmm. and develop yourself while not overstressing yourself with Mm -hmm. the unknown. So you place yourself enough experientially into there where your personality fits for venturing there as much as possible, but also existing within the the confines of what is known. You overdo it, you'll overdo it, you know, you underdo it and you won't develop. So to kind of ground, you know, again, I'm, I'm, physically minded. So I'm going to mm-hmm. ground what you're saying in, into a physical example for me, right? which is a beautiful brick wall. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, which we have a lot which of. You, there's a lot of <laughs> outside beautiful inside. brick walls here. Um, each brick is from the earth, um, is, is put into its forms and is put in different positions inside of a kiln. And is when the kiln's fired, the bricks come out redder or blacker or whatever color, depending on the mineral content of that soil or mm-hmm. the earth. Um, so every brick is individual and different. And so that represents a certain amount of, of chaos in the system. Mm. Um, mm. And yet these bricks can be organized into a right. running bond right. uh, or some other bond. And, and, and built into a wall. You know how you know? horrible the brick walls are where every single brick is 100% the same, like the new, new bricks. That's right. Well, that's, and often those aren't, you know, those are veneer bricks or yeah. they're, they're they, yeah. they, they, they lack. Exactly. They lack that You know depth. they're fake. Yes. And they, they, they read, you know, wrong to you wrong, if, you're, if yeah. you're sensitive to this because they're not. I'm cheering They didn't go right through now. that process. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. They, they didn't go through that that process. They don't have that individuality. That you know, is water such struck a brick truth. is a, you know, traditional New England brick, you know, different sizes even, you know. Mm-hmm. So then it requires a mason to come in and work with those differences, you know, changing that head joint slightly, changing the bed joint slightly to make it work together. So right. um, I'm saying we need more masons in the world. That's That's what I'm getting at. Well, to me, it, it strikes a real chord because you look at that, you know, like fake veneer brick wall, everyone's exactly the same. And what my mind says is that doesn't reflect reality. That's mm-hmm. not true. Mm-hmm. Not that it's a fake brick wall that it's not true, but like every single one of those bricks shouldn't be exactly the same, just like us. Right. Like you project yourself into things. And if you're, if you're, experiencing something that is that canned, right. that is that regimented, that is that perfect, you know it's it's been an overreach of a controlling this, that, or the other mm-hmm. that's produced, produced a false reality mm-hmm. that doesn't match truth. It's sort of a non, non-experience. It's sort yeah. of just, it just you, it's hard to engage with at all. It's sort of just a blank. Mm. This is a kind of a strip mall you know, some kind of situation where that's what they, that's what they put in Yeah. versus yeah. the buildings here that have texture and 
uh, individuality in each brick. Mm -hmm. That that really uh, that gives me a fizzy feeling inside. <laughs> that, that's odd. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the other thing that's um, fascinating rather than interesting mm -hmm. uh, when you when you even overlay. Uh, this idea of conservative and liberal personality types that play a very, very appropriate role and are, and are very needed in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't want to live in a single party uh, country, in mm -hmm. my opinion. You want the poll this way and that way and the, the, the uh, moderate middle to be achieved because yeah. of those. Um, and you want a healthy uh, landing in the middle. That's the, the safest place. Um, you even look at that spiritually or mm -hmm. biblically, you'll mm -hmm. have priests mm -hmm. and prophets mm -hmm. and they served those right. exactly different roles. Yep. And, and to me that, that is uh, a neat thing to see and that, you know, you can overlay that into modern society where, you know, a, a priest is a type that maintains the order that, mm -hmm. that takes what's been accumulated, articulate, articulated knowledge and you know serves the people with it um right. but there's this this whack job that goes out into the woods and eats locusts and is kind of weird but comes back and and the group says wow yeah you actually got something there we won't burn you at the stake we'll allow that one in you know right and it's uh yeah yeah there's sort of keepers of the law and there's you know seekers or finders of uh new law mm -hmm. um and and there's a there's a tension between the two, mm -hmm. and and that's kind of where we. That's dwell. where the that's where the beauty is. The the this that's where the safety is in the tension between those. I think. You no, know, I mean I think that's that's it's that tension is inevitable, and then we have to it's required be, be comfortable or find our way with you know in in that tense position. Right. Right. Where I, we exist. I think to to acknowledge that the tension is beneficial, needed, and were it not there, something would be going drastically wrong very soon. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think you can look at that with you know uh, extreme socialist movements where they had maybe great intentions that they overthrew you know a crazy uh, oligarchy or whatever in Russia. You know, right. and but then eventually with that you know, like, all right, we're going to have the perfect brick wall. You know, mm -hmm. it's like we need a contrast pulling back and right. forth here to, to achieve reality. I think part of this, you know, being comfortable in that tension is knowing that that's part of the, that's part of the design. Mm -hmm. It's designed to be in tension. Right. right. So it, that's not a problem. It shouldn't be pulled entirely one way or the other. Exactly. So, you know, the right side or the left side uh, neither one uh, is entirely right or entirely wrong. Hmm. We exist in tension. So right. you know, we talk about the design of a system uh, like a form of government. If we're aware that that's how it's supposed to work, right. then maybe we can be comfortable with it. Yeah, that's why. That's where I think the the polarization right now mm. is is uh, not beneficial thing i think right. people need to realize like yeah i'm i gravitate this way and i see value in in that as well and and we together you know we do this and i think that's reflected in in good design that that tension between the the different poles and everything else when you when you've balanced those tensions beauty naturally comes out i think and it, it becomes efficient it becomes lasting uh yeah i think that's that's good stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Balancing order and chaos. I mean, I'm sure that's a that's sort of a recipe for for beauty. Really. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm I've got like still goosebumps. That was a really <laughs> uh, I I it, it's very I really appreciate your your thought and and take on that. Um, it's it's really it's a it's a difficult thing to see and relate these these you know very broad and in, in different parts of life, but be able to speak on them at where they intersect actually in design mm -hmm. and architecture and philosophy and spirituality and mm -hmm. everything else and see how they relate. See, I think that, uh, you know, you know, one thing, well, it can relate. You can know all things through knowing one thing well mm -hmm. and seeing like just the, the beauty in a 
a well uh, designed and executed joint in wood. Mm -hmm. um, were that joint made too rigid and not to allow for the flexibility and everything else that is in and that is inevitable that right. joint fails and it's not right. beautiful but that joint uh and seeing how it goes together and how it works with expansion and contraction and and it lasts you see that beauty of you know understanding reality and designing for it and creating that and when you see that through philosophy and life and everything else you 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 really get an idea of you know Wabi sabi to a degree, and and all these other kind of ideas and philosophies around life and design. That uh, when you see it in one place, you see it in the other, and you you start to perceive more. I think you get more understanding, and you and you gain more peace from that. Mm -hmm. So helps me understand myself and uh, have less ulcers. Maybe I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yes, yes, absolutely. But yeah, again, I super appreciate um, that, that uh, you, you came down today and that we finally got to have, have this conversation and, and really appreciate how your mind works and, uh, and really uh, look forward to reading your full article and everything else. And uh, thanks again. Thank you, Trent. I appreciate your thoughtful questions and, and just where, where, where your mind goes as well. Left field. So. Right, right. <laughs> All over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Trent. <laughs>